The follow-up for patients who have received a, a favorable response with semifimab is sort of unknown. I think it's still a gestalt. We're still looking for that answer. Uh, those patients are going to be continuing to be followed uh, regularly for signs of recurrence or signs of disease recurrence uh, or disease progression. Uh, if they've had a complete response, which uh, we'd always hope for, we're looking for that uh, to make sure that tumor isn't coming back or we're not seeing the tumor come back elsewhere. So uh, as far as interval goes, I typically wouldn't see a patient like that any less than every three months. And oftentimes they may be seen monthly um, after they've completed their course or even more often. It really depends, again, on that patient. Uh, for example, a patient who has immunocompromised, they would we'd want to see them quite regularly, especially if they've uh, had a solid organ transplant, lung transplant, kidney transplant, heart transplant, any, any patient that's on immunosuppressive medications, we'd want to see them quite frequently uh, to just keep after um, any squamous cell carcinomas that may recur, and of course also be seen by the, by the multidisciplinary team. If a patient has been treated with semiplomab, then obviously the, the key initial decision making is based on their response. Fortunately, the response rate uh, approximating 50% indicates that uh, at least half of the patients will remain on therapy. Now, adding stable disease adds a population uh, because at present, they're, to, to get semiplomab, the treatment team tends to feel that there's not another effective therapy option. So even stable disease is an appropriate population to continue therapy. So over half of the patients who start on semiplomab will likely stay on it whether they have objective tumor shrinkage or simply disease stabilization, simply because at this point in time, we don't have any better options. Now, the clinical trials uh, with the expansion cohorts in this phase one experience had on average one prior line of therapy. Some had zero, some had two, but primarily these patients had a, a single prior line of therapy. Now, there aren't that many more available, but if a partial response was seen or disease stabilization, that permits the treatment team then to begin to reevaluate whether a low morbidity surgical procedure could be utilized, whether uh, with a partial response uh, radiation could be brought back into it, or potentially chemotherapy uh, where that was not entertained uh, initially. Well, while patients are being treated, patients get seen every three weeks while they get their infusions. We look at their lab work. We assess them for toxicity. Uh, when patients come off therapy, we routinely see them every three months. Uh, if they've had side effects during therapy, we may see them more frequently, but routinely patients do exceedingly well. And once we know that their disease has responded, the rule of thumb, at least in my office, is to see these patients every three months for at least the first two years. Fortunately, semiplomab is coming to market at a good time because most oncologists are very familiar with, with managing and identifying the side effects of anti-PD-1 therapy. So this is an anti-PD-1 agent. The toxicity is very similar to those of the other anti-PD-1 agents that are currently in use for lung cancer and melanoma. So the things that docs really need to look for are itching and rash, um, possibly fatigue, maybe some diarrhea. Um, we essentially tell patients um, that these are pro-inflammatory drugs. They cause the itises. These are my itis drugs. So if you can put an itis at the end of any word, like dermatitis, colitis, hepatitis, pneumonitis, um, these are the things that you need to be astutely aware of. Um, as a potential side effect of these medicines. At the present time, if a patient experiences recurrence or relapse on semiplomab, uh, then the treatment team needs to assess whether there is any surgical option, uh, whether a debulking procedure with then radiation might be useful. There's reason to believe that PD-1 inhibitors may be particularly well suited to enhance radiation therapy because radiation can trigger the ligand PDL1 on the tumors and may actually make the semiplomab more effective. But also, we have new clinical trials and combinations uh, 
which will build on PD-1 inhibitors need to be done for this population. Pseudoprogression can be difficult to sort out. Um, it's not usually seen with single agents. It's usually much more commonly seen with combination therapy and therapies that include CTLA-4. However, every once in a while you do see pseudoprogression with single agent PD-1 therapy. And my rule of thumb is if the patient looks good and the scan looks good, it's good. If the patient is declining clinically and the scan looks bad, that's not pseudoprogression, that's disease progression. But if the patient looks good and is feeling good and the scan looks bad, that's pseudoprogression. Because on your next scan, looking at the patient clinically and knowing that they are getting better physically, that scan is just taking a little bit longer to show the response, and it will. Well, we know that once you get one skin cancer, you're at risk of getting other skin cancers for the simple reason that patients who get skin cancer are patients who have had way too much sun ex exposure over the course of their life. And once you have one skin cancer, you're at a risk of not only getting recurrent or other squamous cell cancers. And again, we don't know if you've been treated with semiplomab, if that essentially negates your potential to get other cutaneous squamous cells down the line. We don't know that. Um, but those patients are still at risk of developing basal cell or melanoma or Merkel cell because of, again, excessive sun exposure. We tell patients to practice safe sun practices, um, such as wide-brimmed hats, using vigorous amounts of sunscreen, uh, using sun protective clothing, trying to stay out of the sun between the hours of 10 and 4. Um, but most importantly, in addition to seeing their surgeon and or oncologist, to really be very diligent about going back to their dermatologist for a total body skin exam to make sure that they're not developing any other type of skin cancer.